I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, Billy, two of the topics that we're talking about today can be problematic for, you know, landowners, the people who own the woodlands, and, you know, just basically everyone in general, depending on what happens. Yeah, no doubt. And I'm really excited about today's show. We've got Dr. Jacob Muller. He's going to be talking about degraded woodlands. And uh, he'll go into a little bit about how they get into that shape and how land management can have a positive impact on that for sure. I'm glad to have Dr. Muller covering that subject. And then we've got a first timer, Renee. We've got Lee Moser. Lee is going to be with us today. Lee is kind of a new member of our department here, Forestry Natural Resources Extension. And he has a lot of expertise and, and water issues. And he's going to be talking about sinkholes. And there are some real things that we need to be aware of about sinkholes. So we're delighted to have Lee as a first time presenter on the show today and uh, Dr. Muller as a reoccurring regular guest. Um, but Definitely. folks, if you have any questions, you can use the chat function to interact with our presenters today or us. We have other um, team members um, in the backgrounds as well. If you've got questions, we can try to help you where we can. If you are on YouTube Live, you can email us at forestry.extension at uky.edu and we can get back to you. But Renee, delighted to be with you and glad to have our audience with us as well definitely because you know we wouldn't be doing this without them so yeah. we greatly appreciate y'all joining us so let's go ahead and get started so right. dr Mueller, if you'd like to join us hi welcome to the show we appreciate you being on again yeah great to be here good to see you billy and renee hey always a pleasure to have you dr Mueller. yeah you're definitely. talking about something that's you know, unfortunately, we've got a lot of in Kentucky, you yeah. know, and that's, um, but hopefully, you know, if we draw some attention to it, we might be able to help folks along the way um, deal with these degraded woodlands. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here again. Uh, always a pleasure to be back on From the Woods today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to you about degraded woodlands. Uh, this is something that is, uh, as Billy mentioned, unfortunately, uh, a common occurrence uh, across Kentucky and really across the region, across central Appalachia uh, and uh, most of the hardwood regions, right? So when we talk about degraded woodlands, uh, we, we mean uh, something specific, and we'll, and we'll get into talking about what, what that is, uh, what causes degraded woodlands, uh, and a little bit about kind of what we can do, right? Uh, and it's it's tricky because it is a complex problem uh, that uh, has a lot of unique uh, characteristics depending on what has caused that degradation uh, in order to uh, manage, to rehabilitate, uh, and to restore that, that function and merchantability uh, in the woodlands. So, uh, quick, just a really brief definition, uh, and this is uh, truly a simplified definition of, of what we're talking about, but I think it kind of encompasses uh, the, the problem, right? Uh, and that's a lack of function in the forest or woodland, a lack of merchantability, uh, and overall health, right? An unhealthy forest uh, that, that lacks these, these characteristics. So a degraded uh, woodland, right? When we talk about merchantability, uh, we often uh, use this, this term to describe the trees, right? Acceptable growing stock, or you'll see this abbreviation uh, AGS. Right? That's what foresters use to describe uh, the amount of merchantable trees or desirable trees uh, in the forest versus uh, unacceptable growing stock, or you might see that as UGS uh, abbreviated uh, if you're looking at uh, any forestry documents or uh, any, any uh, publications that, that reference uh, the merchantability of the forest. Right? And when we have that lack of merchantability or that lack of acceptable growing stock in the forest, that might preclude our ability to uh, harvest, right? to go in and have any merchantable entries into the forest uh, to them that might align with our uh, management goals for that forest. Right? And it can produce both short and long-term problems for the sustainability uh, of that, that woodland. Right. Sustainability can mean a number of things, but if we bring it back to that definition of the what degraded forests are degrading, right? That function of the forest, the sustainability of the function, sustainability of the the, the profitability uh, of the forest, uh, and 
uh, and really the health of the forest, right? That it can perpetuate into the forest or into the future, maintaining those, those characteristics. And unfortunately, it can render some of our commonly used silvicultural methods uh, ineffective, right? Or at least it might take a lot more effort to rehabilitate that, that forest, depending on how degraded uh, that forest is, right? Uh, but I mentioned silvicultural practices, right? Uh, and I, I thought I would quickly reintroduce uh, the definition of silviculture. And right? I've uh, talked about it before on this uh, program, but just to, to refresh you, right? So silviculture, and that's what that's what I study, uh, and that's what uh, a big part of my job is uh, is is in silviculture, right? And that's the practice of con controlling the establishment, so the regeneration of the forest, the composition, which is the diverse suite of species uh, that uh, that call that forest home. Uh, the character uh, and growth of the forest. So the vertical and the horizontal characteristics uh, of that forest or woodland that satisfy specific objectives, right? To meet the landowner's management objective or society in the case of, of our national forests or state forests. Um, but that silviculture is broadly applied to uh, to control these elements or to help control these elements through, uh, through action in the forest, right? So what causes the degradation uh, and some of the effects to the forest? Right? A number of things can impact the forest, uh, but these are the common things that we see uh, particularly here uh, in this region. So past land uses, is a big factor, right? Uh, and that can include a number of things, right? Uh, a couple of them that I'll talk about today, one of those uh, being poor logging techniques, right? Or multiple logging entries uh, without giving a lot of consideration for the residual trees. So residual being the trees that are left behind as opposed to the trees that are being removed through, through the logging. High grading. Uh, and we'll talk about this one in detail uh, as well. Uh, the repeated entries that can have impacts uh, such as compacting soils uh, and again, damage to those residual trees. Uh, insects and diseases uh, directly affecting the health of the forest. Uh, grazing, um, particularly by, by cattle, can have impacts uh, as well as uh, wildfire uh, and a number of other things. But these are kind of the key things that we see uh, that cause degraded woodlands from past land use and mismanagement of those. So we'll talk about mainly just today these first two, but these other, these other components are important. Uh, but we just uh, don't have time to, to cover all of the things that degrade a forest, right? So poor, poor logging. And this isn't to throw shade at uh, the logging community. Um, uh, and that's, in fact, why uh, we have a program right here uh, in the department with partnership with KDF, uh, the Master Logger Program, um, that, that really goes to helping prevent a lot of these, these things, which cause degraded forest. But nevertheless, uh, poor logging can have impacts uh, on the forest, right? And some of the things that it can create uh, are heart rot, right? So rotting uh, in the heartwood of the tree, so kind of from the inside uh, out, which has a number of problems when we're talking about the merchantability, um, the, the, the structure of the forest uh, and its um, uh, sustainability into the future uh, causes form problems, right? And so this is also related to the merchantability of the tree, um, whether poor logging um, causes impacts to those residual trees that might knock them uh, kind of off kilter uh, or uh, create openings or damage that introduces uh, bacteria uh, and thus creating uh, heart rot in, in the forest and it can alter the regeneration and we'll talk a little bit about 
that as well, or at least I'll, I'll show kind of a study looking at what uh, poor logging and not even really poor logging, but poor timing uh, of logging can do uh, or impact regeneration. Right? Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, uh, heart rot, right? And this can happen. Uh, you see it in this this little picture here, uh, resulting from uh, skidding, which is uh, pulling the logs out using a, a tractor or a skidder um, uh, out of the woodlands, uh, causing damage to those trees that, that remain, uh, introducing uh, that bacteria and, and, and rot, uh, removing bark uh, and major damage or uh, branch, branch damage uh, that can also introduce uh, bacteria um into the tree and thus degrade the quality of that tree and if that happens across uh, woodland or out throughout a logging project uh, ultimately having an impact on that entire uh, woodland or that tract right uh, going back to that regeneration question uh, i pulled this this study that was done uh, here in the region uh, and this is just kind of a quick snapshot of that, but it shows some of our main species here, right? And those are the abbreviations that who, white oak, uh, the SC scarlet oak, um, NRO, northern red oak, uh, and black oak being there, right? And this has to do with the timing of the logging and the success of those seedlings. So the success being those seedlings that were there uh, prior to the logging and those that were there following the logging, right? And when those seedlings were over three feet in height, those advanced region, right? Those are those region that are there present in the understory. And then when we, we remove uh, canopy trees, those then recruit uh, into the canopy. Uh, those trees have a much higher success rate uh, than smaller, right? It might be kind of intuitive, uh, but it's important, right? And so this goes uh, to uh, the timing of entry into the forest where we have considerably higher success rate uh, or survival rate of seedlings if we let them mature or do certain activities, right? And we've talked about certain silvicultural prescriptions like mid-story removal to help those advanced region get a little bit bigger and more competitive so that when we go in, right? And if we fail to do that, we can have a regeneration failure, which can perpetuate the degradation of, of the forest, right? Uh, high grading, right? This is a term that uh, I'm quite certain every forest owner has heard uh, and is familiar with, right? And this has to do with the uh, type of uh, tree removal, right? The, the logging practice or even uh, described as a silvicultural practice being a diameter limit cut where we uh, go in and remove the best, mer most merchantable, desirable species and just kind of leave everything else, right? And that's a common because it's really cost effective in the short term, right? You identify the trees that you uh, can make a profit from uh, and go in and just pull those out, not worrying about the other trees, uh, and then just kind of letting the stand um, uh, begin to regenerate itself, right? And there's a number of problems uh, that can happen or do happen when we do this practice, right? Number one, it immediately reduces the emergentability uh, of, of the, the acceptable growing stock, right? The AGS uh, reduces that volume uh, and it perpetuates that, right? When we remove those desirable species, who do you or which species are going to be there to regenerate and propagate their seeds uh, uh, to the next um, subsequent regeneration or the regenerating class or that cohort into the future, right? And so you remove those trees and you're creating a lot of these feedbacks or these negative feedbacks where these less desirable species are the ones that are regenerating, right? So it reduces that over time, right? And we can lose uh, vigor uh, of the stand. Uh, and there's another component here where we're removing the best genetics 
oftentimes, right? And so there's a genetic component of forest, right? Every tree uh, has uh, its own hereditary uh, characteristics, right? And those genes are passed down from tree to tree and good trees uh, lay or drop good seed that develop into uh, good trees, right? And that good could be subjective, but right, desirable growth characteristics, being straight, um, having um, uh, uh, growth or, or adequate growth uh, over time. But when we remove those, those genetics from the forest and we leave those poor genetics, that's what's going to remain. Uh, and over time, that uh, directly impacts the forest and degrades the forest stand or, or cohort by cohort uh, over time. Right? Alters species composition, and this one is kind of intuitive to what I was just talking about. Uh, and it creates a lot of variability in the stand, right? The stocking, the density, the canopy, right? Because you're just going in and selecting the best trees uh, without much consideration for any of that spatial, uh, those spatial characteristics that might help a future stand, you're not concerned about that. So uh, it seems quite obvious why this could be or is a problematic practice that uh, directly impacts the forest and leads to those degraded forests. When we look across uh, the, the landscape uh, here in Kentucky and the region, unfortunately there's a large history uh, or a long history of, of high grading in the area where a majority of the, the um, logging practices or silvicultural treatments are those that go in and remove those best trees, right? For short-term gain, and, and I understand that as a landowner uh, falling on hard times and you have this, this resource and it's easy to tap into, uh, but when we high grade, we're kind of only uh, allowing ourselves to tap into it that one time. We're not investing in that forest in the future to perpetuate returns, uh, kind of thinking about that as an as a investment in your land, as your portfolio, thinking about how to invest with that. Uh, similarly, looking at the species composition uh, of these different treatments, you can see that following those high grading practices, we're left with a lot more maple in the landscape than, the, than was there before, right? Or these other species, oftentimes they're more shade tolerant species that can grow, um, uh, or these um, uh, music species that kind of hang around and outcompete those uh, important species, right? And, and I'm not just talking about economically important, uh, but ecologically important, right? Oak species are really important to our forests here in Kentucky, right? Important for wildlife, for the function of the forest and the health of the forest. When we go in and cut out all of that, right? We high grade out because uh, white oak, uh, even in red oak, a lot of these are more merchantable species. When we cut those out, uh, this is what's left, right? A lot of maple, right, that's been either hanging out in as those advanced region or those seedlings, right? and that's what develops up. And if you allow that to happen to that maple stand to mature, right, it's going to be more and more difficult to rehabilitate that stand into one that uh, is perhaps more historical. Right? So high grading uh, has a lot of impacts uh, to the forest, spatially increases the amount of light, uh, which can have uh, impacts. And it's not, that's not always a bad thing, right? As a silviculturist, we're continually controlling the light regime, right? We're kind of uh, uh, playing around with uh, the, the, the canopy trees, cutting those, then the light that's penetrating through into the forest. And that's an important function of these hardwood forests is the light manipulation. Right? But when we high grade and uh, introduce that light, uh, that can perpetuate those less desirable characteristics and species. Uh, and it oftentimes does increase undesirable mid-story trees right? and creating that, that uh, heterogeneity, which again, might not be a bad thing uh, depending, but it all comes down to the health. So the genetics that's left 
uh, or the genotypes that's left uh, in the forest, the species composition, uh, and a lot uh, of those things determines kind of the, the growth characteristics and the function of that forest. So our goal, right, as a forester, uh, as a landowner, is to build that function, uh, merchantability, and health back into our forest, right, to reverse the degraded uh, forest, to regrade, right, if, if, um, if that, that makes sense. But there's, to me, there's three areas that are important to focus on as, as landowners, as foresters, uh, in order to rehabilitate and regenerate our forest, right? And so we need to think about what's there, right? This is following a high grading or some degraded uh, or just a degraded forest in general. But those residual trees that are there, right? Can they be rehabilitated, right? Is there some uh, functional value uh, retaining them uh, or is there gonna be an uh, investment uh, to go in and kind of do a restoration type treatment or a forest stand improvement uh, to go in and help kind of redirect that stand into one that's uh, healthier and um, uh, and more merchantable. Uh, focusing on the regenerating class, right? So regenerating species, right? Uh, we don't often need to plant trees here uh, in this region because trees grow, they want to grow. It's, uh, that's not a problem regenerating trees, but regenerating the right species can be a challenge. Uh, so planting species or seedlings uh, could be an option if your forest has moved away from those desirable species uh, and needing to uh, promote or uh, redirect that back to one that is um, uh, healthier and functioning uh, as it has historically. Right. And then thinking about the future, right? Maintaining and building that regenerative capacity, right? So that means that ability of the forest to continually regenerate and maintain those positive, sustainable characteristics and qualities of the forest uh, so that the, the acceptable growing stock uh, is uh, perpetuated into the future and regenerated, right? And these are not necessarily the easiest things to, to manage uh, all at the same time. They can be quite complex, right? And as a landowner without uh, a forestry degree or, or training, uh, it's, it's complex and it can be even complex for those in, in the field, right? Uh, so to just quickly kind of summarize, and I know this is uh, a really brief kind of introduction of the topic, uh, a topic that is a large, uh, complex topic, uh, but um, just to, to summarize this, this introduction to the concept, uh, a variety of, of practices um, uh, and events can, can lead to these, these specific and cumulative uh, impacts that degrade the forest. Right? Uh, and there's a number of events that can happen. I described two of those, high grading, uh, poor, poor logging, but a number of things can have impacts that degrade the quality uh, of the forest, right, that have impacts on the, the form, the amount, so the volume, the merchantable volume of the forest, uh, and its ability to kind of regenerate and maintain those qualities and characteristics, right. Uh, each impact uh, has different timelines and requirements to rehabilitate, Right? If there's a loss of species, that could be one of the most difficult tasks to re, uh, I, won't, I don't want to say reintroduce, but to get that species uh, back into the forest uh, where it is growing up healthy and regenerating. Okay? Uh, and it's also important to think about the future. Right? As a landowner, I always encourage landowners to think about what they want their forest to look like in the future, right? Uh, and your goals and objectives for that forest and then work with a forester to help get you there, right? So the, the forest management plan or stewardship plan along with uh, silvicultural prescription is really a roadmap to get you from if, you're, if your forest is currently in a degraded state to one that is, is healthy and functioning, right? Um, and so thinking about 
uh, the, the desired future conditions of the stand uh, and the components of the stand that we can manage uh, and correct uh, over time. Right. So the current stand condition, the, the regenerative capacity of the forest uh, and future subsequent um, regenerating cohorts, right, classes of the, of the forest. Uh, and silvicultural prescriptions, uh, um, I uh, firmly believe should be um, uh, developed with the help of a forester. Uh, there's a number of KDF foresters. Uh, that have training on degraded forests and forest management uh, that can uh, help you uh, rehabilitate or regenerate your, your forest um, and others uh, consulting foresters that, that have that uh, ability uh, across the state. And so if you're a landowner in this, in this uh, situation, which isn't uncommon, uh, there is help and expertise uh, to help you uh, succeed. Right. And the success of those prescriptions, uh, we can gauge that based on obtaining <clears throat> those desired future conditions. So are we meeting our goals? Right. Uh, and we have to have that roadmap and that on a piece of paper for us to know whether we're successful. Right. And so it's important to know uh, what we currently have and what we uh, our goals are uh, for the future. Right. And so forest inventory uh, and assessment is is important first step uh, and then uh, developing that um, management plan with with a forester. <clears throat> there are a number of guidelines uh, that can be helpful for landowners uh, as well as forest managers to kind of help set those standards. Uh, and if you do have uh, any questions, feel free to uh, shoot me an email <clears throat> um, uh, and uh, I'd be happy to provide any more resources. And I, I know that was kind of a, a brief introduction to a big topic, uh, but hopefully that that uh, is at least um, somewhat enlightening on the topic. And I think maybe we've got time for a couple questions. Renee, Billy? Yes, we do. Um, and there are there are a couple of questions in the chat pod. It said, would you call ash at this point? I would say that that's not a question <laughs> that I can answer specifically <laughs> for you. Um, it is a, a difficult topic, obviously. Um, I don't know, Billy, what are your, the latest you're hearing on? You know, well, you know, I guess it really would depend on the landowner's objectives for the property, right? And then I guess the other question I would ask is the ash causing a problem, right? Um, if it's not causing a problem for you currently, there's a little critter that's going to take care of it pretty soon enough. So um, I guess I would base it on if it is impeding my management objectives. And if it is, then yeah, it's a good candidate for coal. If not, I think nature is going to run its course, um, or at least the emerald ash borer is going to run its course and probably get it and take care of it. So mm -hmm. that would be, you know, it's always balancing, you know, your time and the reward for that effort that you put into it. And if it's not hurting you, then maybe it's not worth putting that time and effort to trying to treat it would be my initial thought. Yeah. yeah. And the next one was, do you recommend cutting honey locusts? Uh, again, it's, I think it's kind of the same answer that Billy just, <clears throat> it based, <clears throat> it's not a one size fits all. Um, there's not a one size fits all answer. And it depends on your goals um, for that, your land. If, if honey locusts fits into that, it's not um, particularly uh, a non-native species here in the region um so however you approach that um i think kind of depends on your own personal gotcha. objectives for us exactly gotcha. you, you know J jacob i really appreciate you doing this presentation you know because i think a lot of landowners may not be aware that they're sitting on degraded woodlands right and they just like you like you pointed out they don't have that necessarily that background or that understanding maybe they inherited the property um after these practices had already been in place so you know just raising the awareness that there is an issue is is critical and you did a great job with that uh, um, dr stringer often says that our woodlands are worth about a quarter of what they could be in Kentucky because they've been degraded so much. So again, just getting people aware that's huge. So thank you for that. You did a really good job and, and, you, and you, you simplified it really nicely. So again, thank you very much. Great presentation.
Yeah, thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah. Thanks, bro. Hey, well, we'll have you back real soon. Yeah. All right, thank you. And next, and next up. up is Lee Moser. Thank you for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. And um, he's going to be talking about uh, sinkholes. And that's something, you know, I really not have had thought a lot about until, you know, I said, hey, can you do a presentation? And he was like, yeah, I can do one on sinkholes. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Glad to have you on and welcome as a first timer, Lee. Glad to have you here and part of the team. All right, so thanks, Billy and Renee, for having me on and uh, giving me the opportunity to share with you all a bit about uh, sinkholes today. And uh, I also want to thank Dr. Muller for the great talk on degraded lands, really interesting stuff that hopefully uh, y'all can find a way to implement and make useful on your own properties. So uh, a little bit about me since I'm new to the department as of uh, July 1st. Uh, my background is in water quality and quantity issues. I worked a lot with uh, general ag, trying to address non-point source pollution issues, those diffuse sources of pollution like erosion that comes off of people's properties. So uh, one of the things that we think about sometimes when we talk about water quality and quantity issues are sinkholes, especially here in Kentucky. So today's talk is gonna cover a couple of things. The word karst that you saw on um, the opening slide, we'll cover that and what that is. It's occurrence in Kentucky. Well, then we'll go into some specifics about sinkholes, which is a type of karst formation. And then we're gonna make that connection to water quality and quantity issues. And uh, as you can see on the slide at the right, it may be obvious sometimes what that connection is when you have a surface water stream flowing directly into a swallow hole uh, going underground, but sometimes it's not so obvious. So we'll talk about that as well. And then uh, as land managers and property owners, I'm gonna talk a bit about what you can do to try to coexist with sinkholes on your property. Um, and we're gonna to try to do all that in about 15 minutes or less. So we'll, we'll see what we can get done here. All right, so uh, I mentioned the word karst and that may or may not be one that you've heard before. And simply put, karst is a word to describe the landscape uh, that's underlain by dissolvable rock. In our case here in Kentucky, that's limestone. And it's known for a surface that's interspersed with sinkholes, sinking streams, caves, and springs like you see in the diagram that I'm sharing on the screen here. Um, and one of the things that I wanna talk about today, and I mentioned previously, is that we care because there's that opportunity for surface water and groundwater interaction. And uh, there are some unique challenges associated with living in cars that we're gonna highlight. Um, some of those can be seen on this little diagram. You're seeing surface water going underground, coming back out at a cave spring. And um, one of the other things that you might notice is a topographic divide for a watershed. So in non-karst areas, managing water resources, uh, we usually do so talking about watersheds, all the area that drains to a common point across the surface of uh, the ground. In karst landscapes, it can be a little more complicated. So if we look, um, let me get my little laser pointer highlighter up. I think I've got it. So we've got our topographic watershed divide here. We'd expect in a normal non-karst landscape, everything on the left side to drain to the left, everything on the right generally to drain to the right. In this type of environment, it might not be so easy. So if we have a neighbor on one side of the hill with a sinkhole, something enters the sinkhole, it could come out on our side of the property. And if we're watering livestock, getting water from a spring, uh, we might be drinking our neighbor's contaminants. So certainly something to consider when we're living on karst. Uh, we wanna be a good neighbor to those adjacent and downstream. So karst in Kentucky, uh, what does it look like? It's rather widespread. About 55% of the state of Kentucky is underlain by rock with karst potential. And about 38% of the state has at least some known karst development. And roughly 25% is known for really well-developed features that you may have heard about in the past. Historically, uh, karst features have been really important for our settlements um, popped up around the state. And I'm thinking primarily of springs. So here in Lexington, where I'm at, uh, we've got McConnell Springs. And in Georgetown, we've got Royal Spring. Uh, and Versailles adjacent, we've got Big Spring. And all these were reasons why people settled adjacent to these areas. It's a readily available source of water. 
Um, but some things that we're really going to focus in on today are um, some of the hazards associated with karst and sinkholes and what we can do to avoid those. And there are some less common things that we may not think about. Uh, I've already mentioned just the general potential for water issues uh, in terms of water quality, but there's also the potential for flooding with sinkholes. Um, we'll talk about how to identify sinkholes, things of that nature, so that we can avoid building structures in them. And another thing that's somewhat less talked about, but really important, um, radon commonly occurs with a lot of karst features and limestone around the areas that are shown on this map in Kentucky. So if you are a homeowner living in some of these areas, uh, it might be advisable to go ahead and have your home tested for radon because of the risk of co-occurrence of radon with limestone and karst. So um, moving on. So some of you may have sinkholes on your property or seen sinkholes that look like this. This is more of a livestock crop background. Um, but it really highlights the potential vulnerability of these sites for interacting with livestock, the manure that they produce, any fertilizers or pesticides. We've got a manure spreader going across uh, this corn stubble in a field, and you may see in the background there a little sinkhole. So we're going to be talking a lot within this presentation about setbacks and fencing and different techniques that we can use to kind of avoid and protect sinkholes that may be occurring on our property. So uh, people may remember the Corvette Museum bedrock sinkhole collapse back in 14 that was pretty dramatic. And they don't all happen like that. Um, in that scenario, the roof of the cave below the Corvette Museum collapsed and uh, eight cars were swallowed up, which is kind of an interesting kind of dramatic scene. Um, and that's really the less common way for sinkholes to form in Kentucky. What's more common is what's shown in this diagram here. So essentially um, water filters through the soil and a soil arch develops. Uh, over time, a channel has developed in the limestone, a conduit, if you will, uh, from the dissolving of that limestone and water and soil enter the cave system. Fractures and stress cracks develop in the soil profile. And over time, that soil arch that formed collapses and we can have slumping and sinking. And these are the types of sinkholes on the landscape that you're likely uh, used to seeing. And these are often referred to as cover collapse sinkholes or dissolution sinkholes. So you're really seeing that interaction between what's on the surface and what's happening underground and the transport of soil, anything that might be attached to the soil and anything that might be dissolved in the water into underground systems. So uh, when we talk about surface water, we like to kind of uh, say, if it's on the ground, it's in the water. And um, when we have sinkholes on our landscape, it can also be in the groundwater because of those connections that we just identified. So I'm going to take a bit of a holistic approach to sinkholes as we work through this presentation today. Uh, when I say holistic, uh, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, but I'm going to talk about all the different things that kind of might be happening on your property, whether that's having a home, outbuildings, septic systems, uh, perhaps you have some livestock, and perhaps you're conducting uh, some sort of forestry or silvicultural operation. So we're going to tie all of those things into things that landowners can actually do on their property to uh, best protect not only sinkholes and water quality, but also their property and interests. So uh, like anything else, it kind of starts with identifying where things actually are on your property. So what are some resources that you can use to actually identify sinkholes on your property? Uh, one of the more common ways that has traditionally been used is just to pull out the old topographic map, look for concentric circles with uh, hatched lines going in, and this would be a depiction of a sinkhole on the topographic map. You see another one here, another over here. So these might be commonly overlooked uh, by a map user, but that's really some important information there. See these little black dots? These are structures that have been built adjacent to it. So imagine if this was built you know, just a little bit further over and the ground below it was constantly being lost to a sinkhole like we saw in the previous diagram. So another way that you may want to try to identify these on your property is through the use of interactive uh, topographic maps on websites. 
If you're familiar with the water maps tool on the master logger website, you can actually uh, zoom into properties and interact with them. And there's topographic indicators that are much like what you see on a traditional uh, topographic map with the concentric circles and hatched lines. The Kentucky Geological Service also has a lot of really excellent mapping resources for you to use, um, including some map layers that show um, identified sinkholes as well as modeled sinkholes from aerial imagery and um, remote sensing that's been done. So really useful tools of both of those links. Uh, and the other great way to do it is just to get out and drive or walk around your property and visually identify and mark them on your map. And uh, I always like to just recommend if you're not really comfortable with doing that or using any of these tools to either reach out to myself or your local extension office or natural resources conservation service to help you uh, identify these features on your property and implement some of the following practices that we'll talk about. So this one may seem intuitive, but uh, avoid building structures on or in known sinkholes or near karst features. It's not always so obvious where these things are. They can be really large and difficult to perceive uh, just standing on the ground. So these are just a couple of historic examples from one of the publications that the KGS put out. The home on the left, you see the stair stepping in the brick, if I can get my pointer to show up again. And this basically was caused by a sinkhole formation under this home. At the time of this photo, this was about $40,000 worth of damage. Um, so it's really important financially to make sure you identify where potential sinkholes are on your property before building uh, homes or outbuildings or things of that nature. And then on the right, you see a home that has been subject to sinkhole flooding. So uh, actually building a home in a closed sinkhole, if it has drainage area that's coming to it, you could end up flooded time and again, and it may not map out on a FEMA flood zone map. So certainly a good idea to uh, consult with a professional geologist or a professional engineer with experience in identifying these sorts of things if you're thinking about building homes or structures. Uh, reaching out to either Extension, NRCS, or the KGS might also be a good step to make sure that you're not potentially building on uh, an area that is high risk for sinkhole development. So on a similar but slightly different tangent. Uh, this is something that many of us have probably seen on our uh, either neighboring properties, our own properties historically. Sometimes uh, sinkholes have been used for uh, dumping grounds, essentially. Uh, where I'm from, uh, they're often called the going away hole. And you can kind of see what's going away here. A lot of trash, refuse, some Manure, and we indicated earlier that with that connection of surface to groundwater resources, that runs the high risk of uh, basically introducing pollutants into the water sources that flow underground that might be coming out on uh, your neighbor's properties or uh, providing base flow to streams and waterways and has to eventually be cleaned out for drinking water purposes somewhere down the line. So how do we tie that in to folks that are managing for timber or um, forestry purposes? So for anyone out there that's managing their property for timber, thinking about the future, uh, we have the Kentucky Ag Water Quality Plan Silviculture Best Management Practice number four, uh, sinkholes, sinking streams, and caves. And this is designed to protect sinkholes, sinking streams, and caves, and other depressions in a karst landscape from disturbance or runoff. And essentially the idea is to keep roads and trails away from and out of sinkholes and the edges of sinkholes and uh, keep water control structures from emptying into sinkholes, caves or sinking streams. Uh, and this is shown in this diagram with the uh, arrow indicating basically the slope of the land and your road should be basically sloped away from your sinkholes. Other things that you'll see on this diagram are things like logging debris that's been naturally left where it is. Uh, it's not been stockpiled there. So I'm gonna speak on that for just a second. Um, so logging debris and other materials uh, can be used to block off runoff from entering a sinkhole, like this barricade that's shown here. Uh, however, debris and soil cannot be pushed into the sinkhole. 
uh, debris generated from topping and delimbing, like these couple of tops might indicate are okay to leave, but intentionally accumulating tops and debris and sinkholes is not permitted. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the additional challenges associated with that here shortly. Uh, so something that you may not think about a whole lot is uh, siting a septic system. And it's a little bit more complicated than sometimes uh, given credit for being. Uh, but when we have a direct conduit from the surface to the groundwater resources, siting things like a septic system becomes really important. So this is where we're going to implement a setback of 70 feet to an open sinkhole throat, um, basically to ensure that any of our leach line fields aren't emptying or draining or infiltrating and percolating into groundwater sources through an open sinkhole. Uh, so setbacks and vegetative buffers are really important techniques that uh, are a part of that silvicultural best management practice number four that was previously mentioned. And these are going to look a lot like the uh, setbacks that are associated with streamside management zones. Uh, they're going to depend greatly on the slope of the land. So for instance, if you have 5% um, slope on your land, you're going to want to use a setback of 30 feet minimum for any roads, landings, trails, things of that nature, uh, when you're operating adjacent to an open sinkhole. Uh, it's also highly advisable to observe a setback of 30 feet from the bottom of an open sinkhole when applying fertilizers with pesticides. And, um, you know, that's not always really easily practicable when you're out. But one way that you might try to help visually cue yourself is either setting up vegetative buffers or markers to kind of identify that sensitive area adjacent to a sinkhole. Uh, so, my previous work before coming to the Department of Forestry focused a lot on livestock operations and protecting water quality and livestock operations. Um, many landowners do a lot of different things on their property, right? So you may be managing for silviculture on one part of your property, but you might also have livestock. So what if you have sinkholes in your livestock pastures? Uh, one of the things that we highly suggest doing is considering fencing them away from the sinkholes. Again, to try to protect that water quality, but also uh, to potentially protect the cattle from getting into an open-throated sinkhole. Definitely talked to a lot of producers that have had calves found or lost, uh, depending on the situation, in sinkholes that are open. So it can happen. And then finally, uh, one question that I get asked a lot when I talk about sinkholes out at uh, county talks or things like that is, can you repair a sinkhole and how do you do it? Well, you can. But we like to try to protect and avoid and buffer first, and then consider repair if necessary. So I hesitate to share drawings of what sinkhole repair looks like because of the potential implications of improper repair. Uh, it's really important when you're doing a sinkhole repair to consider where water is coming from and routing to it because we don't want to uh, potentially impact the ability of water to flow into your sinkhole because it may end up getting rerouted elsewhere on your property and cause flooding issues. So this is one of those situations where it is uh, best to go slow, if you will, and contact either NRCS or the Kentucky Geological Survey about uh, options for sinkhole repair on a sinkhole that you identified on your property. Um, again, the best thing that we can do is to implement buffers and setbacks Utilize that um, silviculture best management practice number four to guide those setbacks if you're actively managing for timber on your property. And then just making sure that we're keeping up with those good housekeeping things on our property, like avoiding piling waste and refuse into the sinkhole, uh, which can uh, lead to sinkhole clogging and additionally kick water onto places on your property where you may not want it. So if you have a sinkhole that presents a safety hazard is actively eroding or enlarging, consult with an experienced geologist or engineer to evaluate and provide recommendations on suitable fill treatment for the site. It is possible, but I think it's one of those situations where it's so site specific, it might be irresponsible of me to just give you a drawing of how to do it, so. 
That being said, in summary, uh, some simple steps that you can use to protect sinkholes and water quality in your property, again, are to identify locations where sinkholes actually exist on your property and mark them on a map so that you can communicate them to people that might be working on your property, like uh, a logger, so that they know, hey, we need to implement streamside uh, buffer setbacks uh, adjacent to this sinkhole so that we can protect water quality. Um, avoid building on in or near sinkholes or other cars features. As are appropriate setbacks for septic systems near known sinkholes. Uh, consider implementing buffers or fencing. Uh, avoid placing debris or waste into sinkholes and consider removing any waste that has been placed in sinkholes in the past. Kind of the opportunity to clean up some of those things now that uh, we know better, right? Um, and avoid applying fertilizers or pesticides in sinkhole areas. It can introduce those into water sources and uh, we wanna avoid that as much as possible. And again, just to reiterate, if you have a sinkhole that you feel is in need of repair, contact a resource professional, reach out to Extension, reach out to NRCS and get the ball rolling on uh, perhaps a site visit, doing a little recon to see what might be the best options for addressing sinkholes on your property. And uh, it wouldn't be a water quality talk if I didn't plug developing an ag water quality plan. So that uh, silviculture best management practice number four related to sinkholes that I mentioned is one of the approved ag water quality plan best management practices here in the state of Kentucky. And there is now a new tool and portal for developing an ag water quality plan. You can still do the old paper copy if you need to, but um, this is kind of a streamlined way of documenting the management practices that you're implementing on your property to protect water quality. So again, you've probably heard this before, but if you're a landowner with 10 or more acres engaged in agriculture or silviculture, and those are contiguous acres all together, uh, you wanna develop an ag water quality plan. And there's a little added bonus for why you wanna do that, not just to protect water quality, but it may also open up doors and opportunities for various cost share programs so uh, if you're thinking about pursuing CAPE funding, state cost share or EQIP funding, uh, this is kind of your ticket in the door to get some cost share funding opportunities, depending on priorities and funding availability where you are uh, to implement things to protect water quality. Perhaps you want to um, put some fencing up or set up a vegetative buffer. There might be funding out there for those sorts of things to help you out. And uh, I always like to share my recommended resources when I start wrapping up. These are the three resources that I really use to kind of shape this publication. And they're great reads on a rainy day. If you're not familiar with them, you should certainly check them out. Um, but other than that, that's what I've got to share with you all today. I think I kept it under 15 minutes. So you did great. Yeah. Thank you. We really appreciate that. You know, we have. What I wanted to know is like, how would you know like you're going to buy a property or you're looking around your current property? You're like, is that just a hole somebody dug or is it, you know, it isn't a safe hole. You know, what, what would you do in that case? Yeah, I would certainly consult with mapping resources first to see if it is a known map sinkhole. Uh, again, you could go to a traditional topographic map or some of those resources that are web-based like uh, the water maps tool that's available through Master Logger's website, or perhaps some of the KGS web maps that are available that use uh, remote sensing and uh, ground truth data to kind of show folks where those might be on their property. Uh, but then also, if you're really struggling in that and have questions, whether it's just a hole that somebody dug or a sinkhole, I'd say reach out. It's always best to either reach out to Extension, your local NRCS agents, things of that nature. So. Yeah, Lee, you could help save people a lot of frustration and a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, just being aware of that, you know, I think there may be a lot of landowners still maybe unaware of what they have on their property. So, I mean, you're shedding some light on it. It's really important. Yeah. Good presentation. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, we'll have you back again. You know, hey, water is kind of important to all of us, right? So, um, yes. So, anything we can do to help protect um, our water that we consume and others, you know, yeah, it's important work you're doing. Thank you, Lee, very much. Yeah, absolutely. Good deal.
All right, Renee, great show. We had um, covered degraded woodlands with Dr. Mueller, which he did a really fantastic job of kind of raising the awareness of that issue. And then we had Lee sharing about sinkholes, and which again, I think, and it's an awareness issue. There may be people, and, and you're right. How do we know it's just not a hole in the ground, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> No, good, good. Appreciate y'all being with us today, certainly. Definitely. And you know, you can always go to fromthewoodstoday.com when you're trying to go and what were those resources Lee was telling us about? You know, um, in a, within a week or so, they will be posted on fromthewoodstoday.com and you can go back and review it. And like I said, we've got, you can binge watch us if you wanted to. We've got hours and hours of content on there. Yeah. Um, so we greatly appreciate you joining us because you're the reason why we do this show. If you have mm-hmm. questions, you know what? Shoot us an email. Yeah, and we'll try to address it in a future episode. And, you know, you can also help a friend or a neighbor or family member that has an interest in woodland wildlife by directing them to From the Woods today. And we hope to see them and you next week at 11. Take care. Bye. Bye. From the Woods Today.